All right, hello everyone. You can take your seats. Our next speaker is Herb Garrity, uh, the Executive Director of Rehumanize International. Um, it is a group that we've done a lot of work with in the past, and a lot of our sort of members and interests sort of overlap. Um, and we're going to have a talk uh, about the, I think, was it Consistent Life Ethic? Or what was the title? Oh, it's in there. It's in there, I'm sure. I'm going to get the title. Come on. I got this. Radical inclusivity, every human standing for every human. So let's give a round of applause for our speaker. Thank you. All right, hello. So as he said, my name is Herb Garrity. I'm the executive director of Rehumanize International. If you're not familiar, we are a secular nonpartisan human rights organization dedicated to creating a culture of peace in life. Our mission is to ensure that each and every human being's life is respected, valued, and protected. We adhere to an ethos called the consistent life ethic, which I normally have to explain, but here I don't think I need to so much. But basically, an opposition to all forms of aggressive violence against human beings in all stages of their life and in all circumstances. You guys know this. So at Rehumanize International, we often say that we embrace a philosophy of radical inclusivity. And so that's what I'm talking about today. In short, radical inclusivity means being both inclusive of whose rights we are working to protect and who we are working with in order to achieve our goals. The first part of this equation is simple. With the consistent life ethic as our guiding principle, we aim to leave no human being out of our realm of consideration when it comes to human rights. This philosophy guides us at minimum to oppose aggressive violence against all human beings in all stages of life and in all circumstances. People from all different backgrounds um, can arrive at this philosophy by a number of means. For many people, ideas about inherent human dignity are integral to their faith tradition, while others have pointed to a variety of secular and humanist philosophies that lead them to a consistent opposition of nonviolence um, or towards nonviolence toward all. Regardless of underlying belief system, at minimum, we should all be able to recognize that as humans, we are members of a rational species, and we have an existence that is unique and unrepeatable. Further, what makes us unique is not just our physical appearance or makeup, there's something more, something greater, an untouchable aspect of ourself, something inherent to who we are as human beings that makes it impossible to just replace any one of us. When a human being is killed, someone who is totally unique in all of time and space has ended. And so this is why the opposition to aggressive violence is so foundational to the consistent life ethic. After all, if we are going to claim to be supporters of the concept of human rights, it does not make sense then to pick and choose which human beings rights we would defend. So in practice, again, you guys know this, but for the video, um, proponents of the consistent life ethic, such as ourselves, are working actively to end violence in the form of war, abortion, capital punishment, torture, police brutality, embryo destruction, euthanasia, and other manifestations of discrimination and abuse. The idea that every human being should be able to live free from violence is not in any way tied to one religious belief, political persuasion, or social identity. Indeed, the foundational ideas that the ethic is based on have been present in many different religious, spiritual, political, and philosophical traditions across the globe. Today, people from all different backgrounds, races, faiths, and politics can and do embrace this philosophy because it is one with human dignity at its core. However, the unfortunate reality is that at this point in history, the consistent life ethic is not yet a widely held belief system by a large percentage of the population. Most people, even those who do hold a commitment to human rights or to nonviolence, end up making exceptions somewhere along the line. There's a great amount of cultural pressure to conform to the dominant ideology, and unfortunately, the acceptability of certain types of violence are the norm in many of our institutions, including law, politics, and medicine. Further, in our hyper-polarized and partisan climate, the pressure to conform to those in your same political, religious, or social in-group is even more immense. Here in the United States, as ASP members know, um, 
We have both major political parties embrace positions in their platform that put them at odds with human dignity. And so for most of us, embracing the consistent life ethic as a whole typically means breaking with some commonly held uh, beliefs of those in our cultural in-groups. As a result, the consistent life ethic movement is not inherently liberal, moderate, or conservative. Rather, we are a movement made up of individuals who fit into the categories of liberal, leftist, conservative, distributist, libertarian, anarchist, moderate, undefined, and beyond. In practice, that means that even within the consistent life ethic movement, we will often find ourselves working with those who have radically different belief systems and positions on issues outside of direct violence than we do. Radical inclusivity, after all, does not mean uniformity. Rather, I believe that it is only through embracing our ideological diversity and welcoming and working with those who we may have strong disagreements with that we will win. This, of course, can be challenging if you're used to organizing or spending most of your time primarily with people who you share agreement on with most issues that are important to you. It can be especially challenging when these political disagreements feel like they have a personal dimension, as they often do for people with marginalized identities, or when disagreements are based heavily on personal faith-based convictions that are simply not up for debate by one or both sides. This can cause serious friction when it comes to movement building, but I believe that recognizing this challenge and facing it head on provides us with opportunities for success in ways that other more ideologically homogenous movements lack. Simply put, as consistent life ethic advocates, we do not have the luxury to be exclusionary in our organizing. Larger and better funded movements than ours have been brought down by the idol of ideological purity. More importantly, I believe we do a major disservice to the victims of violence we claim to oppose if we do not create a movement that is welcoming to as many people as possible. Our primary goal is not to just have a collection of the best opinions or even to win debates about these topics. It is to make substantial changes in law and policy that will lead to a decrease in violence against human beings and prevent individual human lives from being taken. If we want a chance of achieving that goal, it is necessary to get as many people on board as possible, and we will not achieve that with factionalism and infighting. If we only worked with people who shared our worldview or who agreed on every other political issue, we would simply never get anything done. If we truly care about the victims of abortion, war, capital punishment, police violence, and other forms of state-sanctioned abuse, we should put their needs above our comfort and commit to the challenge of radical inclusivity. Rather than attempting to enforce uniformity in beliefs, we should be grateful for this ideological diversity and use it to our advantage whenever possible. Practically speaking, having people in our movement with various perspectives allows us the opportunity to better reach people from all walks of life. In our hyperpolarized society, it's becoming more and more rare to have friends across the political aisle. We need an ideologically diverse base of consistent life ethic advocates to ensure that this position is represented in every social, religious, and political sphere of influence. Rather than arguing about ancillary issues, we should be grateful when we find someone radically different from us who also opposes aggressive violence against human beings. Our focus instead should be on reaching those who do not already agree with us on these core issues. Because the consistent life ethic can be and is shared by people with radically different faiths, political meanings, and other categories that divide us, that means that it often does not require a complete shift in worldview in order for most people to become potential new adherent. Though the philosophy itself is not mainstream, most people do share an opposition to at least some forms of violence that we oppose. This means that we often only really need to change a person's perspective on a few relevant issues, and often the issues they do agree with us on are based in some other foundational beliefs that they hold. For example, we know people who believe in a right to life and therefore oppose abortion and euthanasia, or people who value nonviolence and non-discrimination and therefore oppose police brutality and war. Of course, these foundational beliefs are in no way at odds with the consistent life ethic. And so rather than approaching someone and attempting to change their entire belief system, B 
being able to first demonstrate some amount of sameness on the areas that we agree, and then encourage them to be more consistent in their own approach to human rights will always be an easier path to conversion. I have personally known people who are pro-choice who have told me that before me, they had never met another pro-life person. This means that these people had never had the opportunity to hear the pro-life position explained to them, and they struggled to even understand why someone who they otherwise liked would be against abortion. Their pro-choice stance relied almost entirely on thought-terminating cliches such as her body, her choice, or pro-lifers are all old, straight, conservative, Christian, white men who hate women. But when presented with someone who interrupted that narrative and even agreed with them on other issues such as healthcare policy, LGBT rights, or opposition to the death penalty, they were much more likely to be willing to listen. Further, the pro-life liberal is uniquely able to effectively demonstrate why they feel that the anti-abortion position actually aligns better with concepts widely valued on the secular left, such as equity, nonviolence, non-discrimination. Because the pro-life position has both sound science and philosophy on our side, this foot in the door is often all a pro-life activist needs to successfully bring another individual into the fight for preborn lives. If instead the pro-life movement was only made up of conservatives, it's likely that opportunities for a conversation would simply occur less often because we're more likely to spend time with people who are more like us. And even worse, it's possible that the conversations that do occur would be counterproductive if the pro-choice liberal felt that their preconceived negative notions about pro-life people were affirmed. I've seen plenty of conservative anti-abortion activists get dragged down into debates about unrelated issues by their conversation partner accusing them of not, be, not really being pro-life if they support policies such as cuts to welfare or are not affirming of LGBT identities. In those cases, the pro-life conservative is now spending their time defending their position on those issues rather than making a cogent case for freeborn rights. When the reality is, we do not need to change an entire, uh, a person's entire worldview in order or political outlook in order to bring them to recognize the humanity of the unborn. Similarly, if the consistent life ethic movement was only comprised of political liberals, we would simply not have the necessary opportunities to reach conservatives on critical issues such as the death penalty and war. If consistent life ethic advocates exclusively use the you're not really pro-life unless line as a weapon against conservatives, we would lose opportunities to have productive conversations that could lead to change as part on these critical issues. I have seen firsthand right-leaning consistent life ethic advocates being taken more seriously by conservatives and in right-wing spaces on issues like the death penalty and police brutality and war because they are able to authentically share how the life-affirming position on these issues is not at odds with the wider conservative worldview. They're able to use language that is most persuasive to that demographic because they believe it themselves when they say things such as the inalienable right to life should apply to all, or even citing shared religious texts they find compelling about whatever issue they're talking about because they themselves relate to the underlying viewpoint. This ability to demonstrate sameness is crucial to breaking down barriers that our political paradigm has caused many of us to create. We must seek not to alienate people from our movement by unnecessarily exclusionary language and posturing. Now that said, inclusivity should not be absolute. However, I don't believe that attempting to set the boundaries for an entire movement or for, uh, by it should be the job of any one organization like for Humanize or individual like myself. Um, this work is fundamentally that of changing hearts and minds towards a life affirming posture. I want every single person in the world to embrace a consistent life ethic. However, I recognize that I may not be the best messenger for every person. After all, believing that every human being on the planet deserves the right to live free from violence does not necessarily require you to like or want to spend time with every human being on the planet. <laughs> and so I wouldn't tell a person of color that they must be willing to work with a Klan member in order to build a broad anti-war coalition. And I wouldn't tell a member of the LGBT community that they must partner with the Westboro Baptist Church or else they don't really care about babies. <laughs> Whatever boundaries people personally have should be respected. 
However, I don't think it's productive to attempt to draw those lines or boundaries for others or enforce a cancel culture mindset where we are intentionally shrinking our impact within certain communities. Further, the core of our ideology is based on the work of every human being. It can be somewhat easy to apply this in the political context, manifesting as the consistent life ethic. However, this understanding of humanity should also extend to our personal relations, both with people who we agree with and with who we disagree. Despite being a consistent life ethic organization, more often than not, at Rehumanize International, we're partnering with single issue groups. This means more often than not, we may be working with people who disagree with us on one of our core issues or more, or even directly work to advance violence in various forms. This means one day I can be partnering with individuals on an anti-war event who volunteer for Planned Parenthood and support taxpayer-funded late-term abortion. And then the next, I'm attending the March for Life with people who work to get Trump elected and who are un unapologetic and supportive of the harm that he caused to migrants and asylum seekers. This can be frustrating, but I really do believe it's important for two reasons. Don't get me wrong, I understand the desire for the comfort of ideological purity. I would love if I could just work with people who I found totally unproblematic. However, like I said, I really believe that we must be willing to put the needs of the victims above our own comfort. Ultimately, Whatever group we're fighting for, I believe they deserve a movement that is dedicated solely to advancing their right to live free from violence. And while I do want everyone to embrace a consistent ethic of life, I don't want to risk advancing that cause at the detriment of achieving those discrete political aims that will actually save lives. The second reason that I think it's important to remember that the people who you might find distasteful or who uh, you think believe things or do things that are harmful is that they are in fact people. And crucially, I believe they're reachable. I refuse to allow us as a movement to abandon opportunities to dialogue with people with different views on these important issues. In fact, one of the reasons I organize under the umbrella of the consistent life ethic is that it provides us with these opportunities to reach people who otherwise would be completely unreachable. I see constantly when I'm with conservatives, even if we're simply working on abortion and euthanasia, um, we can do that in a way that is productive. And then we go out to dinner or we get drinks or we get coffee and I get an opportunity to present my case against the death penalty, not in a way that's distracting. I don't need to go to the March for Life or pro-life event and call them out, but I can call them in and say, listen, you already believe this. You already believe in the right to life. Let's talk about being consistent with that. And the exact same opportunities happen on the left when I get to demonstrate that pro-lifers don't just care about babies before they're born. You see me at the Black Lives Matter rally. You see me organizing against the death penalty in my state. You know I'm not just trying to oppress women. That's not, this, that's not what this is about. Um, and so it gives you an opportunity to reach people that other people that, that, that I know for a fact would not be listening to a pro-life person <laughs> if they uh, if they did not demonstrate their sameness in other ways, I'll put it nicely. Um, but I am I'm running out of time, um, so I'm going to end it there. Thank you so much for listening to me. We have a couple minutes for questions. Thank you. Sure, yeah. Um, and you know, and when I say anti war, it's sort of like when I say anti abortion. Um, what I'm talking about when I say anti abortion is I'm against elective abortions. Um, of course, miscarriage can be labeled as an abortion, and as can certain uh, like miscarriage management techniques like a DNC. When I say I'm anti abortion, obviously I don't mean to criminalize miscarriage. Um, similarly, anti war is sort of a shorthand. Um, at Rehumanize International, we do have people within our ranks that um, consider themselves just war theorists um, and they're totally welcome that we're not an exclusively passive, pacifist organization. Um, and so typically when I'm not kind of being trite with it, um, I, I'm often talking about anti-imperialism um, and 
essentially as a citizen of the United States, I feel like that's where I have my uh, my ability to make an impact. Um, I don't think that like Vladimir Putin really cares what I have to say about his actions, um, but we we can have an impact on our policies, and I think more often than not, United States foreign involvement. Um, specifically with funding weapons and terrorist organizations in various uh, countries and regions um, has led to more harm than good. And so we, we're, not, we're not super strict about what you gotta, what you gotta qualify as to consider yourself anti-war, but um, I think that trying to reel back the, uh, the negative impacts of the United States military is where I tend to do my organizing. Yes. Yeah, so you were part of the last conversation without getting into the specifics of that. Uh -huh. It was brought up that, you know, people trying to organize with other groups and maybe being told, well, we don't want to organize with you because you hold this particular position or that particular position. Um, so I know you addressed that a little bit in your talk, both in terms of the way that by focusing on the common ground issues that gets you the inroads, but also about the reasonable boundaries in terms of inclusivity and not forcing people to work together who don't want to work together. So I guess if we are trying to reach people, how much of that information should we volunteer about our other positions and how much of that should we hold back in order to make those inroads without being dishonest or deceitful? That's a good question. Um, and that's something that I'm constantly, we have, we have a chapters program and that's something that we're sort of constantly navigating. Um, Always be truthful is the, the first answer. Don't try to hide your beliefs. Um, it's not gonna work and then you're just don't do it. Um, but I think that um, for me, I typically, when I'm entering a single issue space, it's normally for a particular purpose. Like we're organizing a march or we're organizing a conference or we're doing something, you know. Uh, and so when I'm in that space, I don't really feel a reason to talk about the other issues that I care about. Um, it, I think that it can sort of be counterproductive and isn't, isn't worth my time. Um, and so I found that when I do that, when I just show up and I personally am demonstrating, listen, I'm doing all this work, like here, we're you and I, so we have a graphic designer here, we'll make the poster, let's do this here, I'll, I'll bring the tarps. Like we're volunteering to do stuff that's actually benefiting. We're not necessarily just um, coming and saying, oh, hey, we're also anti-war, hey, we're also anti-abortion, can you put our name on the poster? Um, I think, because I, I think there's a tendency to do that with small organizations sometimes. Like, we do just want to be on the Facebook group. Like, we want our people to see it. You know, it's, it's good. Um, but I think that my advice for avoiding situations where you're going to be excluded is to step up and start doing so much work that if they had to start excluding you, because what normally happens, it's normally the, it's the, normally the abortion thing, right? Um, what normally happens is that most people don't really care. But there's a couple of key activists who get really loud and really mad about there being an anti-abortion group involved um, and then they lobby the other people to get kicked out and that's happened to us twice before in anti-war spaces um, but truthfully i believe uh, in that time that was one of the opportunities where we were like yeah put us on the facebook group we're around and we hadn't dedicated work to the cause yet in, in that space. And so I think that by uh, being actually active, we get the same thing in pro-life spaces sometimes too, where people think that the consistent life ethic is just all about um, distracting from the abortion issue or like convincing Catholics that they can vote for Democrats and then support abortion. Um, I, I, I hear that constantly, that that's what the consistent life ethic is. Um, and I think the way that we try to counter that narrative is that we are so active working to end abortion and to support mothers that you could not look at the totality of what we do and think that we're trying to distract from the abortion issue. Um, and the same is true in those in those other movements. Just do so much work that you are an asset to that movement and they need to include you. It's cut me off when I don't think I take another question. Okay. How, how uh, should we respond when there are, are, are potential allies who uh, are inclined to exclude us for the the other uh, ways that we collaborate with, with groups that they might not agree with. Can you say that quicker? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> how, how should we respond to okay. when when certain groups who we would you know collaborate with yeah. refuse to collaborate with us because of our inclusivity of that's a big, it depends. Um, I think that most of the time, 
almost all of the time, I am not interested in making a big scene about it. Um, and this, and there's probably disagreement about this within the humanized too, but um, for example, if it's like an anti-war march and we previously were involved and then we got kicked out, I still think that that event is important and I want it to go on and I don't want to start tattling to everyone and like trying to say, well, don't go to that because they were mean to me and they don't want me there. Like, what I have done in the past, the, the one, one and a half times we got kicked, it was the same event that we got kicked out twice. Um, but, so they like forgot about it. But um, what, what happened with that is we said, okay, like don't put us on the poster. I'm still gonna go because I still support. And so we went and we were there and we weren't disruptive. Um, I remember there was, we, we had signs, we brought anti-war signs and there was this group of people who were leading the charge to get us not involved, who kept trying to like kind of, kind of keep us out. But it was obvious that our signs were just, you could not tell the difference between us and the people there. Maybe I had like a consistent life on a shirt on or, you know, something to represent some other issues, but it was clear that we were just a part of it. And so that's my advice. Just keep doing the work. You know, like if you're, if you're local, this has never happened, but if like your local sidewalk advocacy chapter really hates that you're not a Republican, like really hates that you're uh, not working to get Trump or DeSantis or whoever elected, um, Say okay, don't you don't need to put me on your schedule, but I'm still going to be out here this weekend. So take that for what it's worth. I still don't think this work is important, and I'm going to do it. If you don't want to partner with me, that's fine. But I'm not going to stop working for justice because you're mad about it. <laughs>